Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you are having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, thanks for being here. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Lindsay Parton. Parton was the babysitter of a three-year-old named Hannah Weshi. Hannah was dropped off with Parton just before 7 a.m. and was rushed to the hospital shortly after 7 a.m. What happened in this short, short time frame? Let's talk about the case of Hannah Weshi. Before we get in today's case, let's talk about today's sponsor for today's video. Yes, an amazing company, Cerebral, is sponsoring today's video. Mental health management is always in the forefront of my mind, which led me to Cerebral. Cerebral is a mental health platform that provides clients access to ongoing online medication management and therapy for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and other conditions, all for a flat monthly rate. Additionally, in some states, treatment for ADHD, bipolar, and PTSD are also offered. Cerebral takes a comprehensive approach to mental health care, providing clients with both evidence-based behavioral therapy techniques as well as medication management. This combination of both types of care have shown the best results. I am a homebody and really do not like leaving my house, so every since I've been able to take my appointments from home, I am not looking back. Cerebral operates in a telemedicine model, meaning you can schedule visits with your provider, care counselor, or therapist when it's most convenient for you. Who doesn't like convenience? Do not have to leave my house? Sign me up. Your information is always private with Cerebral. Their comprehensive care model is designed for long-term treatment. And what's amazing is 75% of users reported an improvement after their second visit. Not to mention that Cerebral is super affordable by being three times less than traditional therapy services. To get started with Cerebral is easy. Let's take a look. You start by filling out a short form online answering a few questions to help Cerebral understand your symptoms. From there, you can choose to subscribe to one of three different membership options based on your needs and budget. Cerebral offers a convenient mobile app available for Google Play for Android users and the App Store for Apple users users. It's like having a mental health team on call. When prescribed medications will be delivered monthly with free shipping and monthly video calls and unlimited online messaging with a care counselor or licensed therapist. This is comforting to me because things come up in life, unexpected things. So it's nice to be able to chat anytime that you need them. Invest in yourself today and if you feel this is a right fit for you, click in my link in the description box. This will lead you to fill out a question this will get you connected with a provider right away and your first month only starts at $30. You are worth it. A big thanks to Cerebral for sponsoring the channel so I can continue to put out content for you guys. But most of all, thank you to you guys. I have so many new subscribers. You guys have been amazing and I just want to say thank you. Without you guys, I would not be, so I'm grateful for you guys. You guys are all my little rock stars. Poor little Hannah Weshi was three years old. She was a beautiful little girl, full of energy. Hannah was born, unfortunately, addicted to heroin, so she had a very rough start to her life. She lived with her dad, who was a single dad. Mom wasn't in the picture, or at least in the home. Jason Weshi would work most days 12 hours at his construction job. So he hired Lindsay Parton, who lived next door, it was his next door neighbor, to babysit Hannah so he could work. He knew about his neighbor because Parton was the daughter of Jason's boss. So they were kind of linked together. And Jason and Hannah, the house that they lived in, they also rented that from the babysitter's dad, who was also his boss. So do you see how they're all connected? He moved in, rented this house, and so she becomes the babysitter. Parton 
Burton also babysat other children as well. She had like a little daycare that she ran. She didn't have a ton of kids, you know, she had two of her own, but then she would take other kids as well to make extra money. On March 8th, 2018, Jason texts Parton to tell her he is on his way to drop Hannah off. That was at about 6.52 a.m. So he comes over, he drops Hannah off shortly after he sent the text. She lived right next door. This case happened in Ohio, by the way. I forgot to mention that. It was Hamilton, Ohio, in fact. And because of the snow and cold weather, he drove over to Parton's house, even though she only lived next door. Hannah was wrapped in a blanket when Jason dropped her off. She was really sleepy. Jason gets back into his car and is headed to work. Before he he could even get to his job, he gets a call from Parton stating that he needs to come back. There is something really wrong with Hannah. He turns around, he walks into Parton's house because he's only, it's only been minutes, and finds Hannah is in very bad shape. Again, it's been minutes. What happened? I mean, literally, it could have been even seconds after Hannah was dropped off. So Jason tells Parton immediately, call 911. And here is that call. Hi there. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, what's going on? Okay, my name is Wendy, I'm at 150 Empire, I babysit kids. she relayed that Hannah had just passed out. Parton told the dispatcher that Hannah was fine, that she walked into the house and just passed out, and that Hannah had went limp twice during the call. Parton mentioned that Hannah fell really bad the day before, and she also mentions this bruise that Hannah had under her chin. Hannah was hospitalized with a traumatic brain injury on March 8, 2018. She just never recovered and passed away 10 days later. Hannah was three years and two months old at the time of her passing. One thing that I can say about the babysitter Parton is she liked to talk. And she incriminated herself left and right. Like she was a police officer's dream. She was 37 at the time of the trial. She was said to uh, other by other people that she was a people pleaser. And her attorney, which I found really interesting, kept on saying 
She was stupid. I, I, I'll play a little clip. Lindsay Parton is innocent. I will tell you she's guilty of being stupid. Really stupid. And trusting. But that's not finding her guilty of this. I'm just like, what? If somebody said that about me, I would be so livid. But I guess if it takes that to get her out of going to prison, then okay. But man, I was like, wow. Her attorney was kind of, uh, she's different. She's different. But Parton starts her testimony by saying she was married in her eyes, but never filed the paperwork, so she really isn't legally married. They had done the whole, like, ceremony thing, but she just never turned in the paperwork. So she referred to him as her husband. You know, if somebody asked, she would say my husband, but they actually were not married. It's not a big deal, but it was just interesting that the dynamic that was going on. So Parton had this husband, as she called him, her partner, and she also had two kids. Now, at the time, they were two and three years old. So if you've ever had either a two or a three-year-old, they're a lot of work. So you got to imagine that she's got her hands full. Two and three, those are the worst ages. <laughs> Parton worked for her dad for most of her life. Since she was 16 years old, she did paperwork, admin stuff. She only did this part-time, but then she decided that she wanted some extra income, so she started to babysit in August of 2016. She also sold Mary Kay, which, oh my god, Mary Kay brought me back. Anybody else use Mary Kay? Oh my gosh. Parton, during her interrogation, said that she had hurt Hannah. Here are some clips. I'll just play just little snippets of what she said that was just so damning for her. So after she fell, um, she fell face first, correct? Off the choo choo train? <laughs> no, uh, Thursday when she fell, when she went unconscious. Yes. Um, what exactly how did you move her and into what position did you move her into? I really wasn't sure what was happening, so I kind of picked her up and I was like, Hannah, are you okay? And I probably did the wrong thing because I wasn't sure what was happening at you. <coughs> what's wrong? What's wrong? Wake up, like what's what's going on with you? So you're down? I had been down, down, yeah, and I'm like, well first I said, Hannah, are you okay? Get up. I thought maybe she'd like tripped over her pants or something, because sometimes she'll try to like take off her shoes while she's standing up. Yeah. And she didn't get up, and I'm like, are you okay with up? And she was, like, not saying anything to me. And so I picked her up, and I'm like, Hannah, I probably shook her. Like, are you okay? And I shouldn't have done that. I don't know. What, what, you know. I don't know if I shook her. I just was like, I was holding her. Like, Hannah, are you okay? And then so I laid her down, and that's when I called Jason. And I fell, and she fell. Where, did, where were you at when you fell? Um, against the door, trying to get... Of the door the door opened I was holding her the blanket was kind of like falling because he had handed her to me and I put her down and then I picked her no he put her down and when he walked out the door I picked her up with the blanket and it got tangled up when I opened up the door it got tangled and I slipped so are you on the concrete floor or are you on the step or are you on the top side I was on getting ready I was trying to step up to go inside I lost my balance the blanket got underneath my foot and we both fell she smacked her face on that concrete step and I hit the door. Hey, you can't fight the truth if it, if it is the truth. She later said it wasn't, but anyways. I'm telling the truth. I swear to God I am. I am not lying to you. I do not lie. I would not lie. I wouldn't lie. I just don't lie. All right, hang tight. But what's interesting is Parton said on the previous day before Hannah um, had her incident on the 7th at 4 p.m. that she was playing in the garage and she hit her head on the cement. Parton said she had informed Jason that of this accident and she suggested that he take her to the doctor. But 
Jason never did take her to the doctor, but something happened the day before. Detectives interviewed Parton the day Hannah was rushed to the hospital. Parton denied any knowledge of knowing what happened to Hannah, claimed that she seemed fine, and stated that Hannah just collapsed upon walking into Parton's home. But detectives didn't stop there. The next day, they interviewed Parton again, during which she made multiple damning statements about what had happened in the things that she was doing. She admitted to excessively disciplining Hannah earlier that week and shaking Hannah on the morning of March 8th. So she literally walked into the house and got shook. Parton explained that earlier in the week she slapped Hannah upside her head because Hannah took ketchup and squirted it into the toilet. She's three. She's curious. With regard to the bruise under Hannah's chin, Parton admitted that she twice struck Hannah under her chin, causing bruises. How hard was she hitting this child? She demonstrated the double strike with an uppercut-like motion using like martial arts style claw fist thing. I guess like that. I don't know. But later she would say that she said all that because she wanted to protect everyone. They were questioning whether her husband um, may have done something and maybe it was Jason that did something. And so she said that she wanted to protect everybody, that she was going to take the blame so no one else got in trouble. And she didn't really understand what an interrogation was and she trusted investigators too much. She was playing that I'm naive card, which could partly be true. I do get it. She's never been in trouble before. She's never had a CPS case open for. For all intents purposes, she was clean before this incident. You don't state stuff that isn't true basically to anyone, but never mind the police. Hannah, the little three-year-old, was dying in the hospital. You don't make stuff up. It's a, it's a very serious thing. So I'm not buying that she made it up. Just my opinion. This point of the trial, I am still in doubt and felt that maybe she was innocent. And I'll tell you why, but we'll get there. But what is interesting is the state admitted multiple times in its closing argument that they could not tell the jury what happened to Hannah. They would say, we don't know exactly what happened on that morning. They could only say that she had blunt force trauma to the head, but that was the extent of what they could say. Jason, the dad, told a social worker he had no concerns about Lindsay Parton as the babysitter. She did a good job, he would say. He didn't suspect anything from the babysitter, which I'm wondering if a light bulb turned on in his head because Jason over the months would see bruises on Hannah and Parton actually had to explain to Jason what the bruises were from. So, you know, when you're talking about bruises on your child, you know, he's working a lot of hours. He's like, kids are being kids, whatever. And, and Parton's telling him to put essential oils and vapor rub on him to help her bruises. But he Still, when she was being interviewed and as a suspect, he still didn't think that she could have done it in the beginning, in the beginning. What also Parton did was she went into her search history and she had multiple searches on her Google, but she deleted one, only one of those searches. And that search was how to get rid of bruises. So they found it really interesting that that was the one thing that she wanted to delete. But back to Jason, he told police Hannah had been acting strange that morning, asking to lay down in the back seat for the short ride to Lindsay's house. But, you know, she was tired. It's early in the morning. She's wrapped in a blanket. It kind of makes sense. He didn't state that she was sick. He just said, you know, she was tired. But he did say that Hannah was complaining of headaches for three weeks. Now, when a three-year-old complains of headaches and your babysitter tells you that she had an incident, that maybe you should take her to the doctor, I don't know. Jason told the detectives that Hannah and Lindsay both told him that 
Hannah had fallen off a toy train the day before. She had hit her eye and chin that Lindsay had recommended that, you know, he take her to the doctor. But he didn't take her that night. Must have felt that she didn't need to go to the doctor. But What's interesting is that Jason lied to investigators for over a year about his and Hannah's whereabouts the night before Hannah's incident on March 7th. He told detectives that he went to Walmart and bought some milk. And why is it always Walmart in these cases? (laughs) Nobody shops anywhere else. It's only Walmart. But the detectives did not find any milk. They did a search on his house and they found no milk. During the trial, Jason stated that his friend Chris Davis had been sleeping at his house and that he, along with Hannah, had driven over to Chris Davis's home on the evening of March 7th. Now, it's been a year. Why are you now just giving this information? I'm not sure why Jason left that out. It seems like if you're leaving something out, it's because you don't want people to know. So I'm not sure why he left that out. I'm not even sure if it's important, but because he didn't say anything, it almost makes it important. We don't know. Investigators use the read technique on Parton, telling her she was so f- And they actually lied to her and said that Lindsay had died. This is abuse. They just pulled a plug on this child. This child is dead. And she hadn't died yet. So they were doing the most to get Parton to talk. And it worked. She did talk. Just days after Hannah passed away, the police went straight to Parton. They got a search warrant. They had already gotten a search warrant, but they seized her phone for forensic download. They found that her and her husband were having issues in their marriage. They found this through her text. As well, they found a text that she hoped that Jason and Hannah didn't move in next door because she really didn't want to babysit Hannah. And it sounds like Lindsay was kind of a pushover. And so instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I have a lot going on. I cannot babysit Hannah right now. You know, just say no. She took on Hannah and it was more than she could handle, maybe. I don't know. But they never did a download of Jason or Chris's, that dude Chris that was there that stayed over before Hannah was rushed to the hospital. Why didn't they get downloads of their phones? They, of course, searched both homes, both Parton and Jason's house, but the main focus was Parton, tunnel vision. Jason told investigators that Hannah herself said her bruises were falling in the gravel and from a toy train. But the doctors would say that the injuries on the previous days had nothing to do with Hannah's passing because Hannah had old bruises along with new bruises. I've never heard a three-year-old be so articulate to be like, oh, I fell on the gravel. It's more like I need a Band-Aid, I have an owie. I'm thinking, and I'm, it could be totally off, but Jason trusted Lindsay. So I believe that Lindsay fed him that information and then he repeated it just because in the beginning he had no, he did not suspect Lindsay at all. Jason also lied about a few other things during the trial. He said that he fed Hannah that morning some cereal, but they found no milk, as I mentioned, or evidence that she had cereal. There were two plates on this coffee table. I'll enter the picture, but there was two plates and they really focused on this and saying, you know, he's a liar. He didn't feed her cereal, blah, blah, blah. I don't even see how that's even important because, you know, as a father or a parent, you want to be, you want to say, yeah, yeah, I, I fed her. I fed her cereal, not thinking that that's important when he actually didn't. He's busy. He's rushing in the morning. He has to be to work by seven. It's 652 when he texts her. So he's in a rush. He didn't feed her. But they were trying to plant a seed of doubt with these two plates. You guys weigh in. Does do these plates mean anything to you? It sound it looks almost like maybe it was for Jason and Chris the night before, but 
I don't know. During trial, the Hover Township EMT discussed his report that stated on the morning of March 8th, Jason Weshi hovered over Hannah and shook her to wake her up. The EMT and his partner broke protocol to scoop Hannah up rather than putting her on a stretcher and taking her out to their car, their bus, their, what is that, uh, ambulance. So they didn't use a stretcher. They were in this garage. I'll insert a picture of the garage, but it was it was like their play area. Lindsay also babysat another child, and a mom of the child stated that her daughter never came home with any bruises. The other child was evaluated by two doctors and interviewed by social workers, and they found that there was no abuse to this other child. Lindsay's own children were interviewed and the same thing. They had no signs of abuse by a physical exam or a psychiatric exam. They couldn't find that those children were being abused. But if you guys have watched any of my other cases, parents or adults will focus on one child to let out their anger. I have so many cases where I talk about that, where there's multiple kids in the home and they'll focus just on one. And that child would be the brunt of all their abuse, all their aggression that they're letting out. One child that the adult just despises and takes out all of their anger on. It sadly happens. I don't know why, I don't understand. Dr. Dean, the forensic pathologist, noted that Hannah had tremendous hemorrhages in her eyes. Upon examining Hannah's brain, Dr. Dean observed tremendous brain swelling and a shearing injury to the brain. In Dr. Dean's opinion, Hannah's COD was a traumatic brain injury due to blunt tremendous force that went through her brain. A fall to ground level would not cause the injuries that they observed. And they also noted that Hannah would not have been able to walk or talk or behave in a normal fashion after receiving the injury and would have been neurologically abnormal and unresponsive within moments. Dr. Dean's opinion is that Hannah's manner of death was homicide. As I mentioned, the doctor said it was immediate. The associate professor of pediatrics of the Mayerson Center of Cincinnati Children's Hospital, she testified for the state as an expert in child abuse, specifically in pediatrics. At trial, she showed a series of medical file photographs, which were introduced into evidence depicting the injuries observed on Hannah when she arrived at the children's hospital. She noted multiple bruises that she found concerning for child abuse, including those bruises around Hannah's eye, her left ear, under her chin, her upper arms, and also on her bottom. Given Hannah's overall medical condition, in her opinion, that Hannah's injuries were non-accidental with a diagnosis of child physical abuse and abusive head trauma. Someone did this to her. She didn't fall off a little toy train, as Parton kept saying, or fall onto the carpet to get the type of injuries that Hannah had. The doctor stated that the shaking alone could have caused the injuries that resulted in Hannah's passing. And what's interesting is she said that she shook Hannah even before the diagnosis. But the diagnosis is a little confusing because she had shearing as if she was hit with a blunt object. But then they also said it could have been from shaking. So I'm not really sure. Maybe it's two injuries. Furthermore, the doctor would say that Hannah would have been unresponsive after the injury. So it would have been immediate. So that time frame that I'm really questioning, it's when the doctor spoke up that really got me on board that Parton was guilty, in my opinion. Parton also mentioned that she examined Hannah's face when she walked in 
when Jason and Hannah walked into the house, Parton was checking out her face and she had mentioned to Jason, her face looks good, it's looking better. And Hannah had asked Jason, her dad, for a hug. She had asked for a kiss from him and then she asked for another kiss from him. Like she really wanted to spend some time with them. So Jason left. Hannah was acting completely normal, said Parton. She wasn't acting different and she only acted a little bit tired. Hannah told Parton that she wanted couch and donut. And then after this, she fell to her face forward onto the carpet. Now, Parton had several stories of what had happened that day, but it happened within like 30 seconds after Jason left. Like it was immediately. Jason is stating that she is giving him these double hugs and kisses didn't sound like a lethargic sick child. In my opinion, I wasn't there, but you know, she's asking for all these hugs and kisses when you don't feel good. You're, you can't be bothered with that. So I'm not sure that she was sick when she went there. I'm not completely convinced. Parton then admitted to the detectives that she probably shook Hannah hard after the fall, there was a fall too, for one minute. Hannah's head was snapping around, she would say, and she panicked. She also said, probably dropped Hannah. Parton later modified her story once more and admitted that she had shook Hannah before an alleged fall. Parton explained that Hannah had been whining because she didn't want to be there. She wanted to be with her dad. You know how when parents leave their kids, the kids will cry and, you know, it usually passes. They just need a minute. But this frustrated Parton so much that she picked her up, squeezed her, and then she said she fell, and then she was shaking her after this fall. Parton admitted that she was super frustrated. Hannah been whining and crying about her father every morning, and Parton was sick of it. Parton demonstrated violently shaking Hannah and yelling, stop doing this already. Parton admitted that she shook Hannah until she stopped whining. Parton sealed her fate when she uttered those words, in my opinion. But because she was, quote, whining, that is a motive. Like, what happened? And that makes sense. It makes sense that she wanted, she was whining, and Parton was sick of it, and it was early in the morning, and she already despised this child. She didn't want to babysit for her. So it makes sense. She gave the motive with her words. She tried to take those statements back, after her lawyer came on, one other notable thing is that Parton had lost a baby a month prior to this incident. So the thought is she's stressed out, she has this two and three year old, and she was just over the edge and Hannah got the brunt of her stress. She didn't have the patience as she once had. On the stand on cross-examination, Parton stated that she did not think she would get into trouble for telling the detectives that she had hurt Hannah because Jason would have her back. And I believe Jason did have her back in the beginning. She did not believe she would be in trouble for poking Hannah in the chest, squeezing her in the middle, hitting her with a closed fist multiple times under her chin, and shaking her. She thought, oh, I have the right because I'm babysitting her. I can punish her that way. Parton also confirmed that her story about her falling with Hannah was a lie. And she also lied about a bruise that was on her hand, which she said was from the fall. So there's evidence because this woman has a bruise on her hand. What does that tell you? When you're hitting somebody's head, their skull, she's hitting pretty hard. She told detectives the lie about the bruise on her hand because it seemed logical at the time, she would say. There are so many lies in this case. It is unreal. It's like, who, what, huh? April 12th, 2019, Lindsay Parton was convicted 
on one count of endangering children, in involuntary manslaughter, and of course, the big M murder. But anyway, she got a minimum term of 15 years, but she got life in prison. So she has a maximum of life, but a minimum of 15. Now you tell me this woman has never got in trouble. She's a people pleaser. You know, she's as clean as whatever. She's going to get out in 15 years. I, if not, no, she got a minimum of 15. So she has to do 15. So I bet you she'll do her 15 and she will be out of there. And it doesn't even seem like a long time, but it doesn't mean she's going to get out. But, you know, I'm just predicting just because I know she's going to be a model inmate. But that's just my opinion. I don't understand sentencing at all. It seems like one person will get 25 to life for the same crime. Then another person will get 15 years. And it's all over the place. And it seems like it's the same kind of story. But the sentencing is so different. But 15 years? This woman beat this child to death. Should she be out? I don't, you guys tell me. When I went into this case, I was really skeptical and I was really questioning Jason and the night before with this Chris guy, this mystery Chris guy. You know, them not getting an extraction from his phone to determine what he was saying. Um, you know, the bruises that were mentioned in the past. He's a single dad. He's working long hours. He needs to get her out of the house so early so it's just I had a little bit of doubt and if you see the timeline there just wasn't a lot of time for this crime to happen so I was really like how there's no way he dropped her off but it completely makes sense after the doctor spoke but then I was this is uh this is me going a little bit dark but could the babysitter and the dad be abusive. No, no, I'm going to stop thinking that way. It's getting way too dark in my head. Time to wrap this one up. Jason is a victim in this case. He lost his beautiful three-year-old daughter, and I have nothing but condolences. But, you know, when I do these cases, I try to be respectful, but I also like to look at all the evidence. And I think they convicted the right person, and I do think that Jason is innocent. But, you know, there is those things that you just question. So I just want to put that out there that, you know, I have the ultimate respect for Jason. So you guys let me know what you guys think about this case and if Parton could be innocent. Probably not. I'll put the time frame up again. Anyway, thanks to Cerebral for sponsoring today's video. Check out the link below if you guys are interested. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist for you to check out. And also, if you would like to support the channel just a little bit more, you can join to get videos a day earlier. And I also have a Patreon if you're interested on heading over there. But your support here, just watching and liking and commenting is enough for me. So thank you so much. I will see you in my next one. Bye.